I would like to introduce today's speaker, Professor Sandhanam uh, from ISER, Pune. So I want to introduce you I have, to the MSc students. So, so Professor Sandhanam completed his PhD degree in physics from the Institute of Physical Research Laboratory, Ahmedabad, which is one of the premier institutes of physics and the earth sciences in India. And he joined as an assistant professor in ISER, Pune in 2008. And within 10 years, he got elevated to a professor position. He works on various aspects, not only in nonlinear dynamics, but also in statistical physics. In nonlinear dynamics, he is working on several topics, including quantum chaos, complex networks, extreme events, random box, and so on. Interestingly, he also writes popular articles on science for newspaper and magazines. He had contributed several opinion articles for the newspapers for example, in Hindu and Indian Express. His recent popular article, How Effective is Technology in Education, published in the New India Express this year. So if you visit his website, you can get the article, which is very interesting. So with this short introduction, I request the process and Dhanam to uh, start his lecture. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Sandil Velen, for this uh, kind uh, introduction. Uh, I remember last year, I think uh, we had almost planned and I had even booked the tickets to come to Tirichi to uh, give a seminar there, but finally, because of the pandemic, it had to be cancelled. So I'm happy that finally uh, we were able to have this seminar and hopefully I'll have this uh, uh, chance to visit Tirichi some other uh, time. Sure. Um, and. Uh, um, so this uh, talk, I, I was told, uh, must be targeted towards students. So you will see that uh, this talk is mostly meant for students. And uh, so experts in the audience should uh, excuse me, uh, because some of them must be very uh, familiar to them. Let me first start by sharing the screen. Um, Okay, I guess you are able to see the screen, right? I'll make it uh, um, big screen uh, shortly. Uh, so th this talk is about uh, chaos and uh, quantum dynamics. So much of the talk is going to be about um, uh, is going to be about uh, how we can recognize chaos in quantum systems. And there is going to be some part about localization and very minuscule part about uh, uh, diffusion. And mostly it is going to be like a pedagogical talk, not so much of the results and uh, um, I mean, recent results that we have obtained in this. So I have cut down uh, most of that. So with this uh, uh, very brief introduction, let me get into the talk. But uh, to set the stage for the talk, let me first show you some simulations. Uh, so this is uh, three body systems. You can think of it. I hope you are able to see it. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, so you can imagine that you have Earth, Sun, and the Moon. It's a three body system. You know the gravitational potential, so you can actually solve for it and uh, compute the uh, trajectories for each of the bodies. So in one configuration, for instance, this is the kind of um, uh, trajectories that you would get. So you see Sun, Moon, and Earth in a particular kind of uh, system. But suppose now I change some parameter, uh, something uh, like this, um, uh, let's say. OK, something like this. So let's see what happens. So you see that you still have the three bodies, but uh, uh, very soon, uh, you will see that it's no more regular. So you can see the kind of haphazard uh, um, uh, chaotic trajectory, trajectories that get generated. And very soon, it actually goes out of view because these particles simply go off to infinity. So they are not uh, anymore here. So this is one example of a, a chaotic system. Let me also show you one more. Uh, again, here, this is a very simple case a double pendulum, you can actually make it in your lab. So here again, the parameter is set such that uh, 
it has a very nice behavior so you have two particles you can actually trace out the position of the each of the particle as a function of time so you can see it like this uh, so there is a red and a green curve that you see now uh, if i suppose uh, change again i i want to change the initial condition so let me give it a large initial uh, energy and restart it so you see that it's no more uh, regular uh, very soon it's going to to all kinds of uh, oscillations so this double pendulum is also an example of a, a chaotic system so this is the kind of uh, uh, system that i'm going to talk about uh, in my uh, talk uh, right now and uh, to place all this in uh, perspective uh, so the message that i want to convey at this point is that you have an idea of something that shows regular dynamics you would say technically you might call it an integrable system or something that shows regular dynamics on the other hand just by looking at it you can say that it's not regular because it doesn't look regular and <clears throat> gives rise to uh, random looking uh, uh, trajectories now if i plot these things uh, something like this is what you are expected to get so you can see that uh, there is x as a function of time so you can uh, these plots are not obtained from those simulation but independently i have put them together so this is like position as a function of time so you can see that it has a sine like curve obviously it is from a system that works like a harmonic oscillator and it's an example of a regular system on the other hand on the right side you see these uh, curves position as a function of time but both of them are quite random but of both these cases the red curve and the blue curve that you see below only one of them is a chaotic system just by looking at it you can't say which one is a uh, chaotic system so let me uh, tell you what the uh, so in fact the red curve comes from the random walk it's simply the position of the random walk curve as a function of time whereas this blue curve down below here is actually position of some uh, chaotic system as a function of uh, time so when you visually look at it there is it's not clear which is uh, chaotic and which is not chaotic because there could be other systems which might show you a very similar sort of uh, behavior uh, so these are called stochastic processes uh, this random walk sort of uh, systems because for instance for the random walk you can write an equation like this so the position at n plus 1th time is equal to position at the nth time plus a random number this is i here so this you can think of as a step size and this is actually generated or taken from a uh, maybe from a gaussian distribution in other words you could say that the random walker at every step will toss a coin and decide whether to go left or right it's equivalent to that and if you trace out the path of a random walker that will also look random like this and these are a class of stochastic processes and they have huge amount of applications in physics but again this is not the subject of this talk um, uh, since i wanted to place these in perspective i'm showing you this but uh, we are more interested in uh, chaotic systems and again there is again a quite a bit of variety in uh, chaotic systems so if you look at this set of equations here so this is what is called the lorentz model don't worry about it if you uh, don't get the uh, idea right now uh, it's not very important uh, for the moment so it's a set of you can see that there are three variables x y and z and you have differential equations uh, for these three variables as a function of time and there are some parameters here let's not worry about it it's a lorentz model in fact it's the almost the first um, um, chaotic system that was uh, written down it's a very famous model it's a simplified model for uh, atmospheric uh, convection now the interesting thing about this model is that if you uh, take a collection of initial conditions so to run this model you need to specify some initial condition let's say at time t equal to 0 you need to tell what are the values of x y and z but instead of giving one initial condition you can imagine that i am giving a collection of initial conditions a distribution of initial conditions just like this uh, round blob that you see here in this state space so this is a space of x y and z and uh, this uh, circular blob that you see here it has an area a0 at time t equal to 0 
Now you evolve the system. Each of those initial conditions will evolve under the action of this differential equation. And after some time, capital T, what happens to that area? That area will actually reduce in this case. It actually in this case it finally settles down to what is called a chaotic or a fractal uh, attractor, you know, which has a nice shape of a butterfly. And in fact, uh, many people say that the term butterfly effect itself comes from the fact that the attractor has this uh, shape of the wings of a butterfly. So in other words, in this case, this collection of initial conditions after some time shrinks in the state space. So it is a dissipative system. So areas in state space are not preserved. Okay, so a t is the area at time t, it's not equal to uh, area at time t equal to 0. And in fact, a t is less than uh, a equal to 0. So this, this is a class of dissipative system. And it's also a chaotic system. And a whole lot of dissipative chaotic systems have been studied in chaos literature. In fact, if you look up uh, most of the typical chaos textbooks like Strogatz or uh, Edward Ott's book, you will see many, many examples of such dissipative systems. On the other hand, you can also generate chaos from Hamiltonian uh, system, where, for instance, in very simplest of cases, the Hamiltonian is uh, defined uh, something like this. So you have a kinetic energy term, P squared by 2m. I have taken m to be 1 here. And then you have this uh, some complicated, possibly nonlinear uh, potential. So what you will do is you will write out the Hamilton's equation of motion. So I have written the Hamilton's equation of motion. And if you solve this Hamilton's equations of motion, you can write Q, that is the position as a function of time, and momenta as a function of time. Now again, you can ask the same question. Now to solve this uh, system of equation, so this equation is like the previous equation that we saw, uh, first order differential equation, possibly coupled. Now you can ask the same question. Now I take a collection of initial conditions and these initial conditions at time t equal to zero, they define this area A0. Now you evolve each of these initial conditions under the action of this Hamilton's equations of motion. And you ask the question after some time t, what happens to this area? So here in this case, the area itself will change in shape, but the crucial difference is that these areas are preserved in phase space. Okay. So uh, phase space is your space that is made up of all the PIs and QIs, momenta and uh, positions. These areas never shrink and they don't grow. So the areas are exactly preserved. More technically, all the Poincare invariants are preserved under the Hamilton, uh, Hamiltonian evolution. So most of this, in fact, all of this talk is going to be about chaotic systems in chaos in such physical systems for which you can actually write down Hamiltonians. So in this sense, these are called conservative systems, which means that they tend to uh, preserve areas. So irrespective of whether your system is a conservative system or a dissipative system like this Lorentz model, chaos looks the same. Like I have shown here, uh, some x as a function of t, it will look like a random uh, um, uh, a random uh, time series. It's only when you look at it in state space or phase space, you will notice that actually areas are either shrinking or the areas are uh, preserved. Okay, now let me put this in perspective. On one hand, you can have linear systems. For instance, a very simple linear system is something like this. dx by dt is equal to alpha x, extremely simple system. And you can actually immediately write exact analytical solution for this. And all linear systems, you can even extend it to any number of variables, x1, x2, x3, have a coupled set of equations. Until you keep it linear, uh, linear systems have absolutely no chaos in them. A good physical uh, system that's linear is harmonic oscillator. This is something you must have studied in your uh, physics textbooks. So the equation that I have written down here is simply the Hamilton's equation of motion corresponding to a harmonic oscillator. So rest assured that all linear systems have no chaos in them. On the other hand, when you come to nonlinear system, so you have this dx by dt, it's equal to some nonlinear function. It's a function of x and 
uh, some parameter possibly alpha it can be a complicated uh, nonlinear uh, function so here is one example of a nonlinear function so instead of a harmonic oscillator you take the pendulum pendulum has the potential uh, sin x again write the hamilton's equation of motion what you will get you will end up with the uh, a nonlinear equations of motion now what happens in nonlinear system if you have a nonlinear system it's not necessary that it should be chaotic it may or may not be chaotic and in fact pendulum is an example of a regular system it's not even a chaotic uh, system but now if you take a driven or a driven and dissipative pendulum or even a driven pendulum that means that like for instance if you have a pendulum in your clock you know if you don't put in uh, a driving term something like a, like if you don't have a battery or something to drive it or if you don't key it then after some time the oscillations will come to a stop so you need to give it energy continuously to keep it working so that would be a driven pendulum for you that is a chaotic system but then you can ask then why is a pendulum working so nicely in a clock simply because the parameters are so chosen such that it doesn't show you the chaotic phase so in general the lesson is that linear systems have no chaos however complicated they are linear systems no chaos but non linear systems may or may not be uh, chaotic now uh, uh, you you can ask the question are, are these all simply some mathematicians imagination you write out equations and uh, come out with uh, random looking functions and say that it's uh, chaotic as i try to tell you no it is not a figment of imagination of a mathematician or a physicist they actually happen in a uh, real physical system so as i said a real pendulum can be chaotic or a solar system uh, with say sun and uh, maybe nine planets uh, in fact is a chaotic system all recent research so shows that uh, after millions of years the solar system is going to disintegrate it's not going to stay the way uh, it is uh, today anyway it's a, uh, it's an issue that that is going to challenge the existence of the earth and all the planets but not something that we need to worry about for tomorrow because it's going to happen over a much longer time scales of millions and millions of uh, years away but in any case it's guaranteed that it's not going to stay uh, this way so and and there are whole lot of other cases for instance there are many electronic circuits which show uh, chaos and if you look up literature you will find many Uh, realistic physical systems which show uh, chaos now uh, let me uh, i'm going to now show you a series of uh, pictures i'm going to now uh, show you a series of uh, uh, pictures but as i uh, show you those pictures i want you to think about these uh, questions now i have uh, some physical system which is described by hamiltonian and i know that it is chaotic and i know that it's chaotic because maybe it shows a random looking uh, trajectory maybe that's one reason to believe that it is uh, chaotic now if that is the case uh, what happens in the quantum regime like if i work out the quantum mechanics of such a hamiltonian system uh, where does chaos go is it there it is not there the second question is even if it is there how do we recognize chaos in quantum systems so these are the questions that i'm going to spend time on for the next uh, maybe 30 40 uh, minutes but uh, to motivate that let me show you something uh, at first sight it might look like they are all unconnected but let's go through some of these pictures that i'm going to show now okay so this is uh, Uh, actually this is the picture of uh, st paul's cathedral in uh, london it's an iconic building and uh, it's a, a remarkable bu building in the uh, london uh, skyline so you see this uh, dome uh, circular dome here atop the st paul's cathedral in fact the inside of the dome is shown here in the lower uh, photograph uh, so you can actually realize what is called the whispering gallery mode here so whispering gallery mode is um, uh, like uh, so you stay along the uh, uh, along the edge of this 
a circular dome and if you make a small noise uh, like a small sound uh, that sound actually will travel along this uh, circumference of the dome and come and hit you from the other side okay so you can actually hear it on the other ear and it will keep circulating many many times almost people have reported that it circulates uh, like 7 8 times before dissipating it's a very remarkable uh, phenomenon Uh, so this kind of mode is called a whispering gallery mode uh, because you can actually whisper something and uh, it goes around the circumference of this uh, dome and comes back and hits you on the other ear you can hear it after a, a, a large time gap and it happens again and again until it finally dissipates uh, incidentally um, our own cv raman and uh, sutherland they wrote a paper on this whispering gall gallery mode in uh, the journal nature uh, it's a very prestigious uh, journal in the year 1921 and in fact both cv raman and uh, sutherland uh, they did get permission to go and do some simple experiments inside this dome so based on that they wrote this paper uh, just let me read out one line from here they say that uh, the, uh, that the sound waves travel in comparatively narrow belt skirting the wall thickness of this belt decreasing with the wavelength of sound it's essentially what i uh, said uh, right now so this dome supports existence of what is called these whispering uh, gallery mode now to experience this whis whispering gallery mode you don't need to go as far as london actually it's there even in uh, india right in uh, bijapur in Karnataka. So this is the picture of uh, Gol Gumbas, very beautiful example of uh, uh, Indo-Islamic architecture. In fact, the size of this building uh, to get to sort of understand the magnificent size, you see the people standing here. They are somewhere here. Okay, if you can see the figure, so it's really huge. It's almost size of some eight, ten story building, or even more than that. Again, this is one of the biggest uh, uh, dome. Um, This is called Gold Gumbas. It's uh, in Bijapur. So this again also hosts a similar uh, whispering gallery mode. So if you go there as a tourist, you can try it out. So this is again the uh, inside of this uh, dome and the whispering gallery mode. And another uh, uh, similar thing uh, is again um, are these musical columns. Uh, for instance, the musical columns in the Mahamandabam at the uh, uh, vitala temple in hampi hampi is a world heritage site again it's also in uh, karnataka 14th century uh, temple so you see these columns here you can strike them and each one gives you uh, music of a different uh, musical uh, instrument so again it's one of those uh, acoustic modes that get uh, excited uh, here and similar musical columns are there in uh, places in uh, tamil nadu for instance this uh, nellayappar kovil here in uh, tirunelveli also has similar uh, musical uh, columns and of course i don't want to hurt uh, the feelings of those from madurai uh, i know that uh, it also exists in, in the madurai meenakshi temple as well now uh, you can ask um, what has all this to do with um, uh, chaos and quantum physics we'll see that uh, in a moment but before we see that uh, let's again look at what we are talking about from very simple examples so if i have some simple system like the kind of system that i study in quantum mechanics textbooks like say the harmonic oscillator harmonic oscillator what do i do i take the potential uh solve the time independent schrodinger equation which is given here uh now uh, once you solve the if you manage to solve the time independent schrodinger equation what are the kind of things you are going to get you will get the eigen values like for instance for the harmonic oscillator it is n plus half h bar omega so here you can see the list of first few eigen values and then you will also get the eigen functions this uh, psi so what is plotted here is uh, mod psi square so you can see the ground state first second and third excited states so these are the eigen modes of a one dimensional uh, but a linear system so here the lesson is like given uh, some non linear potential 
I can solve the Schrodinger equation, hopefully, either analytically or sometimes numerically, and we can possibly compute the set of uh, discrete eigenvalues provided it exists, and also the eigenfunctions. Now, let's consider a slightly different class of system. Okay? So, this is the harmonic oscillator which you must have studied in your quantum mechanics classes. So, this is a system which you may not have uh, studied. So, this is called a billiard class of problems. Here, the problem looks deceptively simple. So, I have this uh, uh, region. I have a free particle, free particle defined inside this region. So, here it is a rectangular region. And that region is uh, denoted by this uh, capital omega. And the particle is given some energy and uh, pushed into it. So, the particle does not dissipate energy. So, it is going to uh, uh, essentially do some uh, dynamics, but it is confined within that region. It cannot get out of this rectangular uh, region. So, in general, you can imagine that I can put a free particle inside any, uh, any confined region. The confined region could be a rectangular region or it could be some other shape, arbitrary shape. It does not matter what the shape is. Now, let me show you what happens if you put in arbitrary shapes. Okay. So, here I have a, a what is called a regular billiard. Actually, here the shape of the, uh, the region is that region omega is a circle. So, it is a circular billiard. The name it is called a circular billiard. And in circular billiard, it is actually a linear uh, system in the sense that it is going to generate, I mean, it is not going to show any chaotic dynamics. So, what you see here in the red color uh, are simply the classical trajectories. So, you can solve the Hamilton's equations of motion, generate classical trajectories and plot it. And for one kind of initial conditions, this is what you get. So, you will get periodic orbits, nice, beautiful pictures. Now, you go and solve the time independent Schrodinger equation and plot like mod psi square, just like we did for harmonic oscillator. So, these are the kind of things you will get. For instance, the 100th excited state looks like this. And this is like your whispering gallery mode. So, the mode is supported only along the edges of the circle. So, any, uh, any disturbance that you launch at any point here is going to travel along this mode and come back and hit you. And you can also have other modes set up in the system, things like these. Okay. This is the 1000 excited state, 2000 excited state and so on. But you can also slightly deform this circular billiard like this. This is called a, a cardioid billiard. So, you can see that uh, it is circle but slightly deformed from a circle. And this all help breaks loose in the sense that now the system becomes chaotic. So, you can see that any trajectory that you launch here will give you such random looking uh, classical trajectories. And now you go ahead again uh, solve the time independent Schrodinger equation and uh, plot the mod psi square. As of here it is a two dimensional system which is why you have this x and y. So, x along the horizontal direction and y along the vertical direction. Same thing for the uh, circular billiard as well. So, here you see you do not see any sign of regularity. So, you can see that um, 100 eigenfunction is simply a random collection of waves and so on. So this is what you see in uh, if you do a quantum mechanics of chaotic system. But interestingly, actually much more happens. If this is the only thing that happens in a, uh, in a quantum system, it may not be so interesting. You can already see that regular systems generate something and the chaotic system generate a different kind of wave functions. And I can more or less by looking at it say whether it is regular or chaotic. So, it does not really, uh, uh, is, not, is not too exciting. You would have think that you would have thought that I have already solved the problem. Uh, really that is not the case. There are many surprises. Now, uh, the question is, how do I identify chaos in uh, quantum uh, physics? So, before I answer this question, let me also show you some more. So, this is also, this is called a threefold symmetric billiards. So, it actually has a threefold symmetry. Uh, in fact, if you rotate each of these uh, by 
120 degrees, the um, it will be invariant, so it will look the same. Uh, so what you see is the eigenfunctions of uh, a particle which is confined inside a region which looks like this. And it has a threefold symmetry and threefold symmetry is for a particular reason. Let's not worry about it. But again, what I wanted to show you is the kind of variety that you will get when you look at the eigenfunctions of a, a chaotic system. And this is a more popular system. It's called the stadium billiard because uh, the confining region looks like stadium. So you have this rectangular region and on the sides, uh, it looks like a semicircle. Put them all together, you will have a confined, confining region that looks like a stadium. Like in the previous uh, example, like I told you, everything looks chaotic, uh, at least visually when we look at it. Uh, when we look at the eigenfunctions, but here in the in the stadium billiards problem, it is actually classically chaotic system. But when I do the quantum mechanics of it, it doesn't look very chaotic. It looks like there is a line here. So between the left and right, the left side is actually obtained from experiments, and right side is from simulation. So you see that there is a very nice agreement. So you can actually do experiments on these systems. And you can see that the structure looks very simple. There are some unusual modes that are supported and set up in what should have been actually a chaotic system. So now if you take, uh, uh, take the underlying classical system and plot that trajectory, uh, actually it will look uh, something like this, something like this. On the other hand, quantum mechanically it doesn't seem to show any uh, sense of chaos. Okay. That's a bit of a mystery. We'll see why it is. And in fact, uh, uh, patterns like these are known as Cladney's uh, uh, figures. Actually, he didn't study chaos. As you can see, he is someone who lived in the uh, 18th uh, century. Uh, so you can actually do this experiment uh, in the laboratory. So you take a square or a um, or maybe even a rectangular plate, and you can actually put some, uh, let's say, rice flour on it, spread it out equally, and vibrate that plate. And when you do that, actually, the the flour will settle on patterns like this. Okay. So the Cladney's plate supports these kinds of modes. More recently, people tried to, uh, you know, make that plate in the uh, shape of this stadium billiard, and of course, it shows you chaos-like uh, uh, features. And in fact, uh, Cladney was so surprised um, by the kind of things that he generated on this simple experiment that he actually showed it to Emperor uh, Napoleon, who gave him uh, something like a thousand gold coins or something like that, currently. Anyway, uh, the question for us is, how do you recognize chaos objectively in a quantum system? Okay. So there are, remember, there are eigenfunctions that look like this look very chaotic, but there are also eigenfunctions that look regular, even though the system is known to be chaotic. So how do we like resolve all these issues together? To do that first, we should recognize uh, how do we recognize chaos in a classical system. Let's keep quantum system away for a moment and just look at uh, the classical system. How do you figure out, uh, how do I know if a classical system is uh, chaotic? So there are many measures for uh, for deciding if a system is chaotic or not. But one of the popular things is to uh, compute this uh, uh, Lyapunov exponent. Um, so uh, there is, of course, this formula here. But essentially, what you do is you take two uh, initial conditions, which are close by, uh, like I have shown here. Uh, they differ by a distance d at time 0. That's the initial time. Now you evolve both of them and see how uh, they get along. And if the system is typically chaotic, what happens is that for some short time, initially, they will try to go together. But after uh, sufficiently long time, uh, they their paths will diverge from uh, one another. In fact, uh, they diverge exponentially from one another. So this distance as a function of time, if you calculate, uh, it will have this exponential factor. The rate of divergence is lambda, which is called the Lyapunov exponent. 
what you should remember is that technically and strictly speaking uh, this lyapunov exponent uh, is calculated in the limit of time tending to infinity in other words i need to evolve it all the way up to infinite time and uh, see this exponential divergence okay in practice it is not possible generally we just evolve it for long enough time but strictly speaking i need to be able to uh, evolve it for infinite times that is what the mathematical definition requires now uh, you can take simple systems for instance lorentz uh, system take two initial conditions at time t equal to 0 so if you do that you can see that uh, for at least first uh, 15 time steps shown here Uh, you don't even make out that there are two different uh, trajectories because they lie on top of one another but after about 15 or 16 uh, time steps you notice that there is a black and a red uh, line uh, which means that they have diverged from one another so th this is an example of a lorentz system uh, so it is a chaotic system so it is the case with another popular model called the uh, rossler system now uh, where is this uh, chaos coming from uh, how do i physically understand it it's all nice to know that there are these formulas which you can measure and if uh, this lambda divergence rate is positive uh, you would say that the system is chaotic in which case there is an exponential divergence but physically what is happening so ideally i mean finally chaos boils down to this uh, simple idea that uh, let's say that i have something like like the bowl here which i have shown and there is the small ball if i give it a little bit of a push uh, this ball will simply keep oscillating up and down and finally you can imagine what will happen it will come and settle down here okay which means that under a perturbation this is a bit this is stable okay nothing happens to it you push it it oscillates and finally comes back and settles at the lowest position here so that is at least locally stable there can't be chaos there but on the other hand you invert the this bowl shape try to place the ball precisely at the top it's very hard simply because a little bit if you place it wrongly either the ball will just go down the hill here or it will go down the hill here so this is where your uh, this local instability of motion is generating uh, these kinds of positive lyapunov exponents so if you take two initial conditions which are on either side of this unstable uh, equilibrium point which may be let's say right at the center on one side the ball will go to the left other side the ball will go to the right so the distance keeps increasing possibly uh, exponential and if you have this kind of behavior everywhere in phase space you can see this behavior in occasional discrete points for instance if you take pendulum you will see that some discrete points have this kind of behavior but if you if your entire phase space has this local instability of motion then you will say that the system is chaotic so this is what we will understand uh, this is what we understand as the physical basis of uh, chaos in 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 physical uh, systems now how do we uh, translate it to quantum domain if this is our understanding of um, uh, classical chaos though so there are several problems okay there is no easy way to translate it first thing is uh, you can ask why can't i calculate lyapunov exponent in the quantum regime so it's not possible uh, sorry, just a second yeah. i'm sorry um okay so you can ask why can i not calculate the lyapunov exponent as we just saw you need to specify two initial conditions close by initial condition in phase space you can't do that in quantum mechanics because heisenberg's uncertainty principle tell you tells you that uh, you cannot specify position and momentum with uh, infinite precision at the same time which means that there is no question of starting two initial conditions close by and seeing whether it is diverging exponentially or not so that that doesn't work so the whole idea of using lyapunov exponent in the quantum uh, regime we need to throw it out now uh, you can ask the question like can i try and evolve maybe the wave function as a function of time 
so that is a problem. So if you remember, we wrote down these. Um, uh, I said that you have these classical uh, equations of motion, and these are actually nonlinear equations of motion. Especially if you put in a nonlinear potential, you will end up with Hamilton's equation of motion, which is nonlinear. On the other hand, if you write out the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, and if your Hamiltonian is time-independent, you can actually write down formally how wave function evolves as a function of time, and that is what this is. So this is the wave function at position x at time t is simply this operator e power i h t by h bar acting on the initial state. So initial state is at time zero, and this is my initial state psi of uh, x at time t equal to zero, and this is the operator, and this is always linear. You can even write it in matrix form. It's like matrix vector multiplication. So this is. Linear evolution. There is absolutely no sign of any nonlinearity in the quantum time evolution. So again, you run into a problem. Classically, you you are evolving you are you are evol evolving a nonlinear system of equation, and suddenly for the same equation, when you evolve a state quantum mechanically, you are just doing a linear evolution. Okay? It's not going to show you any sign of chaos. More seriously, you have this what is called the non-commutativity problem. So, what distinguishes quantum regime is the fact that your Planck's constant h bar is not zero. It doesn't matter what its value is; it could be the value that is given in the textbooks, but it doesn't matter whether it is that value or some other value. You can even take it as one if you want. But what is important is that it's not zero. If it is zero, it is Classical dynamics or classical mechanics, and if it is non-zero, you are in the quantum regime. Okay. Essentially, the important parameter is this Planck's constant. Now, uh, you can uh, you remember that in the uh, if I have to calculate anything like Lyapunov exponent, I need to take this limit t tending to uh, infinity. Okay. So there are two possible ways. One is I can take h bar equal to zero and then take t tending to infinity. Now, if I do that. Once you set h bar equal to zero, then your system is already classical, and t tending to infinity it will show you classical chaos. It will not show anything of quantum system at all. On the other hand, if you uh, change the order of this limiting process, first you evolve it to infinite time, which is basically you go to this equation that is shown here, evolve it for infinite time, and then take h bar equal to zero. Then your evolution is quantum mechanical, and that is a linear uh, evolution. And then suddenly, if you put h bar equal to zero, you are not going to see any sign of chaos there again. Okay. So you are caught in a bind, in the sense that none of these. So, so at least the the issue here is that by uh, the important issue here is that these two uh, limits they don't commute. You can't change the order of Uh, these limits and still expect that you will get the same result. There is a problem there. It's an unresolved problem even now. There is no easy resolution to this uh, uh, problem. But in any case, but as far as our problem is concerned, as to how we uh, like figure out if a quantum system is chaotic, is one way is. Uh, Uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you one way about it, but essentially, as an operational definition, we can assume that I would call something quantum chaotic if, if I can, um, if I can do the quantum mechanics of the system, uh, which in the classical limit is chaotic. That is, you take a classical system, and the classical system described by some Hamiltonian shows chaos, and now you. Uh, do the quantum mechanics of the system, and uh, you can say that it is a quantum chaotic system. That is the operational uh, definition. Now, but still, this definition itself doesn't resolve the problem. It doesn't tell you how do I actually recognize if the system is chaotic. It's okay to say that you take a Hamiltonian that's chaotic and solve the Schrodinger equation and do the quantum mechanics. But it still doesn't tell me how do I after I uh, do the quantum mechanics of the problem, I'll get eigenvalues and eigenfunctions like this. 
by looking at it, how am I to figure out if it is chaotic or not? That problem is still not uh, answered. So the answer to that is um, given by uh, what are called the spectral statistics. So in other words, forget all these issues with Lyapunov exponents or quantum time evolution being linear. They are not going to tell us if uh, the quantum system is uh, chaotic. So what is going to help us is uh, looking at this uh, spectral statistics. So it's a uh, bit of an abstract uh, uh, part. Let me try and explain how it uh, works in, a, in, in some simple uh, way. Okay. Let's say that I have some quantum operator. Uh, to keep it simple, you can imagine that this quantum operator is just the Hamiltonian operator itself. And, and its corresponding eigenvalues are simply the uh, energy eigenvalues. Now, if this vertical axis is my energy eigenvalues, and these are uh, these ladder-like uh, lines that I have drawn here, these are the positions of the eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on. And what I want to do is to look at this quantity called level spacing. That is, let's say I take three of these levels. And uh, so let's say this is lambda n minus 1, lambda n, and lambda n plus 1. This will define for me two spacings, Sn and Sn plus 1. And uh, Sn uh, is called a level spacing. So this is the difference between lambda n plus 1 and lambda n. In other words, all I'm doing is calculating, say, things like lambda 2 minus lambda 1 or lambda 3 minus lambda 2 and so on. So given n eigenvalues, I can calculate n minus 1 spacings. The claim is that whether a system is chaotic or not is hidden in the statistics of these spacings. So these are called fluctuations. Uh, these spacings are called level fluctuations. And whether a system is chaotic or not, all that information is hidden in this fluctuations. And uh, let's see, for example, if I had an integrable system, which means that the system is regular, classically the system is not chaotic. I take some such system. And let's say these are the energy eigenvalues. So whenever you have regular system, uh, you can actually assign uh, quantum numbers to it. So if it's a D degree of free freedom system, uh, you can assign uh, n1, n2 up to nd uh, quantum numbers. In fact, a good example is what you study in your textbooks. So you do the hydrogen atom problem in your quantum mechanics classes. And it's a three-dimensional system, three degree of freedom system. And um, uh, so there are three uh, quantum numbers, principal quantum number, the angular momentum quantum number, and the azimuthal quantum number. OK, I'm not counting the spin here, but you have these three uh, quantum numbers. So th this is the characteristic of uh, uh, integrable uh, systems. Now, if I go to a system which is not integrable, that is, it's not, it's not integrable in the sense that it's probably a chaotic system. In that case, what is the difference that I see? In that case, the problem is that I cannot uh, assign these quantum numbers to levels. In other words, the integrable systems, each of these levels, I can actually denote by these three numbers, n, l, and m. So in fact, every level in the hydrogen atom problem, you can uh, give it this triple uh, integers. You can label them by this. It's like giving name to a person. Every Everyone has a name, and each level in the hydrogen atom has these three uh, numbers as their identity like uh, other number, so to speak. And, but if you go to a quantum system whose classical limit is chaotic, it's not an integrable system, then these numbers don't exist. These, you can't assign such quantum numbers. For example, as I told you that in hydrogen atom problem, uh, you can actually assign these. They, they, they virtually identify the level. On the other hand, you take the same hydrogen atom, put it in strong magnetic field then you can't assign such quantum numbers. So th these well-defined quantum numbers don't uh, exist if the system is uh, chaotic. So which means that in, in, in this uh, non-integrable system, when you do the quantum mechanics, you get into what is called a level uh, mixing regime, 
and then the situation is sort of good for doing statistical analysis which is why you take the spacing between these levels and look at the uh, statistics of it and in fact this idea goes back to uh, Wigner's insight it's a paper from 1951 uh, so he actually was working on how to understand um, the spectra of complex nuclei an example of a complex nuclei is this uranium atom so the nucleus of a uranium atom so atomic number 92 which means it will have 92 electrons and inside the uranium nucleus, you have uh, 92 protons as well, and then there are neutrons. Now, how do I, so as I said, once you go beyond two bodies, typically the system is chaotic, and in fact, this is also uh, uh, chaotic. Uh, so how do I uh, actually uh, understand this? So Wigner's insight is that uh, these kinds of realistic physical systems can be modeled as random matrices. In other words, the Hamiltonian matrix, you can write down a Hamiltonian matrix for this problem, just as you would have written down a Hamiltonian matrix, say, for a, a hydrogen atom problem. You can do that for a uranium atom as well. And the key insight is that this Hamiltonian matrix can be thought of as just a random matrix. In other words, it's a matrix where all the entries in the matrix, matrix are simply random numbers taken from some distribution. Now, if I want to study the uh, structure of the eigenvalues of uranium atom, it is okay to just study the structure of eigenvalues of this random matrix. So you can see the connection. On one side, you have a physical system, maybe something like a uranium atom, you have its Hamiltonian, and it has a particular structure of eigenvalues. And the claim is that, forget the uranium atom, uh, it behaves like a random matrix, so just construct a Hamiltonian matrix with random numbers, study its eigenvalues, it looks exactly same like the structure of eigenvalues of a uranium atom. So in general, it is true for all complex uh, systems. So that is the Wigner's uh, insight. So this whole area is called uh, uh, random matrix theory. So to understand what this uh, gives you, let's understand what kind of levels that you uh, I mean, what kind of quantum levels that you get in any quantum system. At one extreme, you have these harmonic oscillator kind of levels. We just referred to harmonic oscillator uh, kind of levels. So it's n plus half h bar omega, which means that uh, if you look at the spacing between consecutive levels, they are just separated by one unit. So which means that every level uh, is separated from the next level by one unit in energy. And if you try to plot it uh, like this in ladder form, uh, you will get something like this, like what is shown here. But what is the implication of this? You place any one level anywhere you want. Okay? You have full freedom to place one oscillator level anywhere you want. Now, once you do that, every other level is fixed because quantum mechanics says that for the harmonic oscillator, every level is one unit away from a given level. So which means that placing one level places all the levels in the spectrum. You get the entire uh, infinite eigenvalues just by placing one, one of them. So this is called a stick spectrum because you don't have much freedom to place the eigenvalues. On the other extreme, you have uh, this level repulsion. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, you have these, uh, the other, other extreme, you have these integrable systems. So here uh, you have what is called Poisson sequence of energy levels, where you place one level anywhere in the energy axis, uh, others don't get fixed. They could come anywhere, they are uncorrelated. Okay? So I place one level here, let's say this one, and the next level could be very close to it or the next level could be very far from it, which is why you see huge gaps. For example, between this level, there is a huge gap. But in some cases, there are two levels which are sticking very close to one another. So you see that all kinds of things happen. So which means that this gives total freedom. You place one level, it doesn't place, it doesn't fix the position of any other levels in the spectrum. So you have these two extremes. One where you place one level and everything gets fixed. And other case, other extreme for integrable systems where you place one level, nothing else gets fixed. So you need to specify the positions of every other level. 
on the other hand so so at this point so you have one uh, oscillator kind and other for integrable non chaotic systems this is how if you do the quantum mechanics of it uh, levels would more or less behave like this but now if you have chaotic system they actually don't fall in any of these classes so you take a classically chaotic system and uh, do the uh, quantum mechanics of it you will generate uh, level uh, spectrum energy spectrum which will look like this so they try to maintain today we call it social distancing in some sense they try to maintain distance from one another in the sense that if you place one level the next one doesn't go very far neither does it come very close so it maintains some sort of distance from a given level so that's why it's called a, a level repulsion so so uh, this is the uh, uh, lesson at this point so uh, you can forget the oscillator level only oscillator shows this kind of a spectrum but the thing of interest for us is that on one side you have integrable systems uh, where you have complete freedom in fixing the levels so if you look at the spacings they could be more or less uh, anything on the other hand uh, uh, you have chaotic systems which will behave uh, like this in such a way that uh, they will try to repel the levels uh, nearby levels try to repel one another now if you look at the distribution of these uh, spacings between the levels this is how it will look like so this is the case for poisson so what is plotted here is the probability of spacings spacings mean uh, the distance in the energy axis between two consecutive levels so i have plotted this for a so this one this curve that you see is for a integrable system and this curve that you see here what is written as go here don't worry about the name uh, this is for a uh, chaotic system so you can see that they are very different and this tells us a way of figuring out if a quantum system is chaotic or not so here is the recipe that means that i take a classically or any classical system i have a hamiltonian i go ahead compute the uh, solve the schrodinger equation and compute large number of eigen values and look at the spacing distribution level spacing distribution something like this and when i look at the distribution if it behaves like this then i would say that uh, it shows poisson spectrum or the system is not chaotic uh if on the other hand it shows a distribution that looks like this like uh, this uh, so called goe then i would say that the system actually uh, is a uh, chaotic system uh the important development is that it just doesn't originally it was thought that uh, this kind of distinction applies only to nuclear physics but that's uh, not true in 1983 it was shown that it works with very beautifully with uh, chaotic systems you take regular systems non chaotic classical systems you will get spacing distribution that looks like this uh, dashed curve here and um, um, uh, you take a chaotic system like this one of these billiard uh, chaotic systems that we saw that we saw uh, the spacing distribution look like this so this is an important uh, uh, significant milestone in the development of uh, quantum uh, chaos Uh, and in fact uh, here this senai billiard is actually this uh, system which is shown here like i told you it's a class of billiard problem where you have a free particle inside a region here the region is a uh, squarish region but there is the central circular region which is scooped out so the particle cannot enter inside this circular uh, region and if you launch any classical trajectory this is how it will look like you can see that it's already very irregular and it is indeed chaotic and in fact this is one of the system which has been uh, shown to be i mean analytically shown to be chaotic exactly chaotic so there are very few such systems in uh, which have been mathematically shown to be chaotic classically chaotic so sinai uh, it's one of the achievements of uh, sinai and uh, so this is uh, the sinai billiards problem now if you do the quantum mechanics of the system um uh, quite interestingly uh, you get spacing distribution that looks like this and uh, so this curve 
which is shown here in red actually follows this distribution here. So this is called GOE. Again, it's a technical thing I will not get into uh, right now. But uh, uh, essentially, uh, this is what uh, it is. Now, uh, this dashed curve here for regular systems is actually an exponential curve. Both are both can be proved uh, exactly. So this is uh, simply a Poisson distribution and corresponds to this curve. So every time you have a non-chaotic system, regular system, facing distribution is going to be e power minus s. And if it is chaotic, it will be this red curve, which is given by uh, this distribution. Okay, and in uh, recent times, there has been a whole lot of work uh, in this uh, field in the last 30, 40 years. Today, it is used for many different things. For instance, for looking at the spectrum of entanglement, uh, quantum entanglement in a many body uh, system. By many body system, here I mean uh, a collection of uh, uh, spins, like for instance, ice, uh, sorry. Um, Ising model or a Heisenberg model and so on. There is a whole zoo of such uh, uh, spin systems where uh, these are uh, studied, such spectral statistics is studied. And in many cases, many such cases, there is no uh, classical limit, but still you can figure out if the system is chaotic or not by use of these uh, spectral uh, statistics. Okay. Mm. Okay, it's again the same uh, result. Um, uh, okay, I don't have much time. So let me uh, try and go forward. Uh, so the lesson at this point is that spectral statistics of quantum eigenvalues can distinguish between whether the system is integrable or uh, chaotic. And the formulas that I showed you, the theoretical formulas, come from an area called random matrix theory. It's, it's really a separate area and a separate talk in itself, it's, uh, it's, uh, I can't even do justice to this in a few lines. But to just tell you one line about it, random matrix theory is basically about the following question. If I have a matrix with random numbers as uh, elements of the matrix, what can I say about its eigenvalues and eigenvectors? So that's uh, the question about which uh, like thousands of papers and books have been uh, written. So that is random matrix theory which is used here in uh, uh, quantum chaos. Now, uh, we should go back to our uh, nice looking eigenfunctions and whispering gallery modes, which is where we started from. This is the second part on the localization. Uh, now, uh, if you remember, I showed you those um, eigen, nice looking eigenfunctions, very colorful, and we saw that uh, the eigenfunctions also look like uh, it is chaotic. But the fact is that they are not always so. They don't always look like chaotic, even though the classical system is chaotic. But quantum mechanically, sometimes you will see structures like this. Uh, so just to recall, uh, uh, for example, so you remember this uh, cardioid billiard. So you see this is one of the eigenfunctions. They all look very irregular and chaotic. But now you see that. Uh, there can be eigenfunctions which also look like this. It's not very much irregular. There is only enhanced uh, probability density here. So what you're seeing is uh, psi square as a function of x and y. Again here, this is a slightly deformed circular billiard. Instead of eigenfunction being everywhere in the space, you see only structures here. And same thing here. This is a quartic oscillator, uh, another nonlinear potential, which is actually chaotic. And normally, your eigenfunction should also look chaotic, but it doesn't look like chaotic. So you see that uh, it has structures only here and here. So these kinds of behaviors are called uh, localization. And uh, in fact, localization is, again, not figment of anyone's imagination. You can actually realize them in uh, uh, experiments. So you can see them in uh, experiments in quantum wells and also in uh, experiments of um, atomic uh, uh, cold atoms. Uh, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about this, uh, why this is uh, surprising. Again, we need to go back to our 
Hamiltonian. Uh, so here I write the Hamiltonian as H0 plus some parameter multiplied by a potential. The reason I write like this is to emphasize that. So the, my total Hamiltonian has this integrable part H0, uh, which means that this part alone is not chaotic. But then there is a perturbation coming from this V and strength of perturbation is this alpha. And if I take alpha non-zero, let's say some positive number, then as this perturbation increases, the system becomes chaotic. That's my background. So at alpha equal to zero, you might, uh, so if you look at the phase space, uh, phase space curve might look regular, but uh, for some large value of alpha, it might look chaotic. Like this. Okay. And since it is chaotic, it will have positively up now exponents and so on. Uh, so all these are just the classical uh, dynamics. There's no quantum mechanics in it until now. But now, um, so like for example, this is the stadium billiard. If you launch a trajectory in the stadium billiard, it's, it is chaotic. You can see how the trajectory is evolved here. It's quite random. And the eigenfunction, if you try to plot as a contour plot, one of the eigenfunctions look like this. In fact, most of the eigenfunctions will actually look like this. There'll be no pattern to it. And if you look at the phase space, so I'm plotting position and momenta or some functions of position and momenta. Again, you see that there is no regularity. It's just a collection of random splatter of points. So this is classical chaos for you visually. And uh, the, uh, the point here, the trajectory of the particle is ergodic, meaning that it will explore every point in uh, phase space. And whenever your uh, classical phase space is ergodic, like you see here, a uh, given initial condition will explore as time goes to infinity, it will go to all the points. That is what ergodicity means. And whenever your classical system is like that, uh, corresponding quantum eigenstates will also be ergodic in the sense that your eigenfunction will be like a, a random structure. It won't show any particular pattern, something like this. This is what is expected. But on the other hand, when people actually computed eigenfunctions of this uh, stadium billiard, what they found is that most of the eigenstates actually look like this. Like the way we physically expect, if classically there is chaos, maybe quantum mechanically it should not show any pattern. Yeah, most of the eigenfunctions are or indeed don't have any pattern, but occasionally you have patterns like this. So these are called localized states because these are high uh, probability regions, this dark region. And uh, the others which are in light color, they are much lower in probability. So most of the time the particle, if you interpret the usual Bond's interpretation of uh, uh, this wave function, uh, basically means that the particle is going to spend most of the time here. Uh, which is, in fact, this is, uh, uh, in fact, there is a theoretical reason to expect that eigenfunctions should uh, look uh, like this. It is called a semi, it is called semi-classical eigenfunction uh, hypothesis. I'm not going to, since I'm running out of time, I'll not uh, probably explain the theory in full. But basically, it's a statement that uh, physically speaking, roughly speaking, if your phase space is going to look like this, your eigenfunction should also look like this. But which is the reason why uh, when people saw such eigenstates which violated this principle, it became, it came as a surprise. It came as a surprise. How, how is it possible that a classical system that is uh, chaotic like this can also support eigenstates like this? Or localized states like this. Whereas we expect it to be like this, but then these are also seen. Uh, okay, so this one is in color. You can see it even more uh, nicely. So this is in Sinai uh, Billiard. Uh, so how do you explain the fact that these kinds of localized states are uh, present? Okay. Uh, the explanation comes from what is called a SCAR theory, but let me not get into the theory, but let me give you a physical motivation why it might be uh, so, uh, the basis of SCAR theory. Suppose, uh, so most of the, any typical uh, classical trajectory in uh, this uh, system is actually chaotic. In fact, that is what we see here. Right? It, it, it will look like this. It is chaotic. And in phase space, you will see like this. Now, suppose I actually launch a wave packet. 
a quantum wave packet on one of these orbits, what is going to happen? It will follow this classical orbit only for a short time. After that, it is going to be broken apart. As time evolves, it will spread all over the phase space, that wave packet. And essentially, it will occupy uh, every part of the uh, phase space. And uh, that is what, in some sense, you can argue gives rise to these kinds of uh, ergodic eigenstates. On the other hand, if, I, if there are embedded in such chaos, there are also periodic orbits. You know, one mistake that we do when we talk of chaos is to assume that everything is completely chaotic. Uh, never, it's never completely chaotic. There are hidden in, in spite of this large scale chaos, there are singular, uh, occasional, individual periodic orbits which could be either stable or uh, unstable. Sometimes you don't see it in the structure. Sometimes you will see small regular island-like structures uh, here. But nevertheless, there are uh, individual. Uh, periodic orbits. In fact, uh, one of the definitions of chaos is that you should have large number of uh, periodic orbits in the system which are unstable. So if you launch a wave packet in such a periodic orbit, periodic orbit is something like this. As opposed to a chaotic orbit which is like, uh, which is like this, a confusing trajectory, a periodic orbit is something which starts from a point, comes back and joins at the same place. That is a periodic orbit. Uh, our Earth is on, a, is on a periodic orbit around the Sun, which is why it comes back to, it, it repeats the uh, dynamics. Now, if you launch a wave packet on a periodic orbit, it will not dissipate. It will keep circulating again and uh, again. Okay? This is the physical uh, basis of uh, SCAR theory. A little more um, uh, arguments based on this idea, you can actually show that these kinds of eigenfunctions or localized states can be uh, supported. And uh, the ones that support these kinds of eigenstates are the ones which have uh, very small Lyapunov exponent or least unstable periodic orbits are able to support these kinds of eigenstates. And these kinds of eigenmodes are also the ones that are related to the kind of whispering gallery modes that we saw, whether in St. Paul's Cathedral or uh, Bijapur or, or in uh, an upper Temple. All these uh, musical uh, columns, in some sense, are related to these kinds of uh, eigenmodes which are uh, supported or localized uh, uh, modes. And again, these localized modes appear in all kinds of chaotic systems. You take hydrogen atom, put it in strong field. As I said, strong magnetic field. Uh, it is an example of a chaotic uh, system. And uh, uh, you can do the classical dynamics. You will see all positively of now exponents and everything. But if you look at the eigenstates, most of the eigenstates will look chaotic, but you will see eigenstates like this. For example, 478th excited state. It has such a simple structure. It's a localized state. Similarly, 468 or 71 and uh, so on. More recently, uh, people have done experiments with the cold atomic uh, gases, even with um, uh, Bose-Einstein condensates. More recently, it's a very hot topic now, finding what are called mini-body scars. That is, you have large number of uh, systems, large number of particles which interact with one another. So if you see, all the arguments that I have made till now, everything is about a single particle in a potential. So even here, in the billiards case, you don't need many particles. You just need, uh, you're looking at dynamics of a single particle inside this billiard-shaped uh, uh, potential. Whereas, in principle, you can think of many particles. And um, that is uh, currently uh, an area, a hot area of research called mini body uh, chaos and mini body quantum chaos in particular, where again you see these kinds of uh, localization effects or uh, scar uh, effects. And these localized states are quite useful for uh, many things. Um, uh, for instance, they can give you. Um, directional motion. So it's like a resonator. So you can think of it as a laser. Uh, so you can, it can give you very directional emission or you can actually uh, study quantum entanglement in uh, uh, systems that show localized uh, states. 
and you can get interesting uh, behaviors, understand more about it, and uh, so on. Uh, maybe I'll just take uh, um, five minutes uh, to just uh, tell you about localization and time dependent systems. So, till now, we assume that the Hamiltonian is time independent, but uh, in principle, a lot of uh, interesting things happen when your potential is time dependent. So, again, uh, here the way I have written the Hamiltonian, so this H0 is the integrable part, non chaotic one. And all chaos comes from this uh, potential, and this is the parameter epsilon. And a particularly interesting uh, sort of systems are what are called kicked systems. You must have studied this in maybe uh, studied this in uh, if you had courses on chaos. This is called a kicked rotor or a standard uh, map. So this you can see is the kinetic energy term, and the potential energy term is given by a series of kicks. It's a series of delta functions. Uh, in other words, you can think of it as a pendulum, and the pendulum gets a kick periodically. It's like someone hammering it periodically. So, which means that it's actually getting energy externally, uh, a periodic infusion of energy, which will keep it oscillating. And if you uh, if you give stronger kicks, then the system becomes chaotic. So, what is shown here is the phase space of the system. So here, for this k basically means large kick strength, which means that you are actually hitting the pendulum with the larger force, and then the system becomes chaotic, as you can see here. Uh, now you can go and do the quantum mechanics of it. It requires a little more uh, uh, work because it requires some Flaquet theory and so on. But uh, without getting into all that, let me tell you what happens here. So classically, uh, you will see diffusion uh, or uh, mean energy as a function of time. So since you are giving it uh, energy externally, you can ask how is the energy distributed within the particles? Can I calculate the mean energy? Yeah, you can do. Classically, you calculate the mean energy and ask how is the mean energy changing with time? So you will see that this uh, line, it actually is linear. So the mean energy it keeps absorbing energy endlessly because you are giving energy it's like a pendulum, you are giving energy periodically, it's, it keeps absorbing the energy and it becomes chaotic. Now, quantum mechanically, the surprising thing is you do the same thing. System is the same. You keep hitting it periodically, you are giving it the energy, but quantum mechanically, the system stops absorbing energy after some time called break time. So, the mean energy, which is shown uh, in terms of these dots here, initially it increases just like the classical system, but it saturates. Okay. Beyond a point, it says that I cannot take what you do to me. I mean, I can't absorb any more energy. So you can keep giving it the energy, but the system is not going to absorb. So the system actually localizes. So this, uh, this is uh, called dynamical uh, localization. And in fact, uh, this is a phenomena that uh, occurs not just in a chaotic system like this uh, kick rotor standard map, but um, but it's something that happens even in um, even in uh, many condensed matter systems. Uh, what is called the Anderson model. Like I guess um, you people may have studied the chronic penny model in your quantum mechanics classes, where uh, you have a periodic potential. But now, if you try to put in some disorder in that periodic potential, it becomes an Anderson model. And that's a very important model in condensed matter physics. And uh, the behavior that you see here in this quantum kick rotor is similar to the behavior one sees in uh, Anderson uh, model. OK, I think I'm uh, running out of uh, time. Uh, so there are many things that can be done uh, here, many interesting uh, properties. Maybe I'll just take one minute to tell you that uh, uh, as I said, uh, you can have a kick rotor where you keep giving it energy periodically with a constant period. So that is this uh, red uh, lines in the lower uh, periodic lines that you see here. So there is a kick given every time there is a red line. But now you can ask the question, what if I randomize it? Like I give a kick, but I don't give it periodically, but I just give it at random times. I keep hitting it at random times. So you now, uh, what happens is, uh, I, I told you that there are these localized states in this uh, system. So if you give it at random times, what happens is that that localized state dissipates. Localization does not exist at all. 
it will become like a classical system. It will continue to absorb energy as much as it wants. On the other hand, if you try to uh, give it kicks um, with with specially modulated uh, uh, time periods between the kicks, or what are called Levy distribution, in that case, it happens that you can actually control that uh, decoherence. In other words, you can control how that localized states uh, dissipate. <coughs> so uh, that's the uh, interesting result. Again, this has implications for um, uh, what happens in many uh, condensed matter systems. OK, I think I've completely probably run out of time and leave some time for questions. But I'll just summarize by saying that quantum chaotic systems are very interesting objects uh, to study, not just because they are interesting, but they have very important applications in pretty much every area of physics. I refer to nuclear physics and condensed matter physics, but in atomic and molecular physics and in uh, quantum chaos is more like a phenomena that you should be able to see in everything. You should be able to see it in atoms, you should be able to see it in molecules, in nucleus, in uh, many body condensed matter systems and uh, whatnot. In pretty much any quantum system, you should be able to see it. And this class of localization, we only briefly saw that it's a very counterintuitive uh, idea. So you can see it in time dependent quantum systems, you can see it in time independent quantum systems. There are different varieties of these localizations, and more recently, one uh, sees localization in many body uh, quantum systems like Bose Einstein condensates and uh, so on. And these tools and techniques, you'll be surprised to know that is useful in many things, for instance, in looking at rogue waves, which are one kinds of extreme events, or Google matrix. And many of these applications have nothing to do with even quantum physics. They are completely outside the domain of uh, quantum physics. So in a sense, the kind of ideas, techniques, and tools that were developed in quantum chaos today is like helping one advance the field towards many body quantum chaos, but also is helping in uh, many other areas, right from financial engineering to uh, you know search problems rogue waves and whatnot so in that sense it's a very dynamic area and uh, if you have any questions i'll be happy to answer thank you very much for your attention yeah. thank you santana any other question from student side so um so if you want to write any question if you want to clarify some doubts, you can also write to Professor Sandhanam. Uh, you can find his email address in his home page. So uh, since there are no more questions, uh, I can conclude. Um, so I thank very much uh, for some, I thank very much for accepting our invitation and uh, deliver a very beautiful talk. He introduced the quantum chaos even the simplest way to the students. I appreciate very much, Sadhanam. So, if possible, I I I will invite you personally. Okay. Yeah, I would uh, of course like yeah, to come. The we, uh, is, uh, find a good certain. time for that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe next year we will meet in person. Yeah, okay. certainly. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So thank you once again. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah.